so who are you? I was walking by, I come into this place, here you are, you sell marijuana seeds, you have beautiful women around, it's like you're the president of the marijuana party. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? Well, this is Mecca. This is our version of Mecca. This is where people pilgrimage to from all over the world to come here to absorb the aura of the world that they see as the future for them. The world they'd like to see, the world where marijuana seems to be legal and people are handing it around and joyfully uh, celebrating it without any fear, without being hunted, without, this is always a sanctuary where a combination of church and pilgrimage site all rolled into one because people feel safe here. They feel safe around me. If I'm not afraid, the idea is they shouldn't be afraid either. And that's what my message is when I go on these tours, is I always have to be unafraid, although inside I can be very afraid. And I remember reading about Martin Luther King. He, on the surface, was very brave and courageous, and in fact was. But inside he had doubts and he had fears mm -hmm. too about being away from loved ones. What have. Well, I've gone on crusades. I've smoked out 18 police stations last year, you know, deliberately to get arrested, deliberately to show the flaw in the law, to show that our people are persecuted and that this happens every city on earth, mm -hmm. right? So it's all a holy quest and people come here for that kind of feeling that they're at that holy site in their life, like people go to Jerusalem or people go to Mecca. They come here. You mentioned crusades and I know there's a this is what you do. You're well. It's not even a personal crusade. Let's use that term. It's like a holy. You know, the Crusades in the Middle Ages were a holy quest. Well, this is a holy quest for me too. Twenty-four million people rounded up, jailed, detained, murdered around the world for marijuana since 1960. And I feel that I've been. It's been prophesied that I would come and do this. That I would take all this energy and all these people around the world and raise people to a height where we could get the acknowledgement that we were seeking and, and freed from the bondage. So it's not even a personal quest. It's like I'm an instrument. And, and I've been guided, and it's been foretold all along that this would be what I would, this would be what I would do. The more human element of the personal thing is when that woman said, "Don't give in to self-pity and, and despair," you know, because it's been a very uh, a road filled with a lot of adversity, and sometimes it'd be easy to just chuck it and say, "To hell with that! Why not do something just pure hedonistically and enjoy life and not do this?" Right? So it is a very holy quest for me. <laughs> well, it's getting pretty heavy, is what it's getting. So um, you have all these really pretty girls around, I've noticed, and uh, there's one right there even. And how do you get all these girls? There's I mean, what's the dozens and dozens of beautiful women in my life. And the other lesson to learn is this, life is short. Cram as many women into your life as possible. Don't give in to monogamy. Because I look at my father, he's 80 years old, he's in a senior's home, and someone's paid to wipe his ass. He was a oak of a man, robust, strong, until he's 75, he has a stroke. And now I'm looking my own death in the face. Because we see our, when we see our parents pass away, we're looking at ourselves in 25 years. In 25 years, I'm sitting there and somebody's being paid $18 an hour to wipe my ass. I no longer have control of my bodily function. I sound strange when I try to speak, and the world is clearly deteriorating. And so I've only got 20 good years left. I might only have five or 10 good fucking years left. Hell, I could die tomorrow. And I think that's an important thing to bear in mind. You've got to grow old gracefully, but you're very mortal. And these experiences only happen in one lifetime, and you've got to grab every single one that goes by. So listen, normally I'm not really a spiritual person. But, uh, you know, and I got an interview recently where they said, so do you consider yourself a spiritual person? And I go, no, 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 that's women talk. You know, when women find something that they can't immediately explain or that they romantically want to embellish, it's all something spiritual, right? This, and I said, I'm not like that. Ah, guys aren't spiritual people. Anybody who says that is just making an excuse for mysticism, right? Because they don't have an answer, right? So they ascribe some spiritual quality to it. So I told him, I said, no, I don't believe in spiritual things. I said, but there is this one incident in my life that I cannot explain that's uncanny. In 1977, I was in London, Ontario, and I ran a bookshop there called the City Lights Bookshop. And I, I started in 1975 when I was 16. I was kind of a, a boy wonder protege. And I was working in my bookshop on a Saturday. I remember it very clearly. And the place was stacked with new books. I used to deal with old, rare antiquarian books, and I'd buy them by the ton. People would be moving and bring me boxes, and I was really, really busy. And I remember uh, somebody, a customer of mine, David Hogg, comes in, and he says, Mark, somebody just collapsed outside your front door. And I go, what? He says, yeah, somebody just collapsed and, and Jim Weaver from Bel Air Music came by and uh, called an ambulance and they just took her away. I said, what do you mean they just took her away? Yeah, right in front of your door, he says. And I go, wow, and there were so many books in my store. I felt kind of bad because, you know, apparently this woman had collapsed only like 20 feet in front of my front door, right in front. I didn't even notice. I was so busy with all these books stacked everywhere, putting them out. It was, and this, and so anyway, 
uh, Jim Weaver comes back later on, and, I, and my neighbor, I've known him for years, and he says, yeah, a woman collapsed right in front of your store. And I called an ambulance, they took her away right away, and I says, well, how is she? She says, I don't know. She was unconscious when she went away. So, so nothing happens. I forget about it. Time goes by. And so three weeks later, on a Monday morning, and I remember it really clearly, she, I get a phone call, and I, and I answer, and I say, hello, City Lights, and she goes, Mark Emery? And I go, yes. Mark Emery, you don't know me. We've never met. But the most profound thing happened to me three weeks ago when I walked in front of your store. She says, I walked in front of your store, and in, I know she said this sounds incredible and impossible, but in the space of under a second, a fraction of a second, I collapsed in front of your store, and in that brief period from the time I felt this terrible, powerful surge of energy course through my brain and into my body. She said, like something was forcing your personality right into me. She said, as I fell to the ground, she said, I learned all about your life in that brief fraction of a second. And of course, you know, I'm listening on the <laughs> phone to this story, and I have no idea why, you know, why me, what's going on? I'm like 19 years old. And she says, I want to tell you this, Mr. Emery, because it's driving me crazy. I was released from the hospital two or three two days ago and she said and it won't leave me and I want it out and my husband by the way this woman she's calling she tells me she's 65 she's fairly old and so I'm listening to her in order to be polite and besides she's got this really heavy sounding intonation in her voice and it sounds like you know she's holding me responsible for this terrible thing that's happened to her. Anyway, she says she's been in a coma for three weeks and she says Mr. Emery in that three weeks I only ever can recall thinking about you and I saw these three symbols about your life. And she says, and I, I know I'm supposed to tell you about these and see if they mean anything to you. So I'm listening on the phone. She says, the first symbol, Mr. Emery, is the symbol of the dollar sign. She says, the sign that you're going to rule the dollar. And she says, you will have control over the dollar and you will use it to forward the progress of the other symbols, of which she hadn't told me yet, right? And I'm going, these symbols. She said, you will rule the dollar. Now, the interesting thing about this is that I learned to count with coins at, at age four. I used to, my dad taught me how to work with money. Uh, he, he was a working class man, but he thought the best way to teach me how to count was with. So every day I would roll up the numbers, uh, pennies, 1946, 26 of those, 1947, 23 of those, and I'd add them up and then I'd stack them in groups of tens. Every day I'd, I'd go over the money. I got my first job when I was seven. My dad used to only give me four cents a day when I was four, five cents a day when I was five, six. You know, and he said, never ask for any <laughs> oh, more money man. because there's no more money. I can't give you any more money, right? So I went to him when I was seven. I said, well, how do I get more money? I need more money because I've got these plans. I was always thinking what I could do with money, right? And he says, well, you have to go get a job. And he later told me I was joking, really. I didn't think <laughs> he'd go out and get a job. But I went around to all the neighbors and I asked them if they had any jobs for me. And I got a whole bunch of jobs. So I started working regularly at seven. I started my own mail order business when I was nine. It was this mail order stamp business. And then I did my first really successful business when I was 11, which was a vintage comic book business. So I was always good with money. So when the woman said, you will rule the dollar, I had a very bit of background, even by the time I'm 19 hearing her say this on the phone, I was very good with money. I'd already been a businessman in downtown London, Ontario for like three years. So you know, that seemed, okay, safe bet, I'm good with money. So she says, you'll rule the dollar. Now late, and she said, and the second symbol, is your mind is like a steel trap. And she says, and I see that, and your mind holds everything that goes in and lets nothing out. It's like a sponge, she said. You've got to learn to use your mind, to use the dollar, and for the final symbol. Now, the thing, interesting thing about the mind is I've always been really adept. I can remember everything. Just like I can tell you it was Monday morning when she called me, it was Saturday midday when she collapsed in front of me, and I remember it like it's yesterday, very clear. I remember the stacks of books on all the counters in my store, even though this is, in fact, 26 years ago. And I remember it really with sharp clarity is I do so many different things in my life. I can tell you my earliest experience that I can recall is my mom towering over me while I'm sitting on the potty and she, I can tell, I don't even understand English, but I can tell that she's frustrated that I haven't gone potty in the in the little porcelain bowl, which by the way I can remember had a little chip in the bottom of it. It was one of those white things, you know, like we used to put on our head as a helmet almost, like everything, it had a little chip. Anyway, I'm sitting in there and I can understand my mother's frustration that I'm not going to the bathroom and she keeps coming back and I can see she's upset about it. I know it's probably very Freudian, but that's my earliest recollection. It's like when I'm like uh, six months to a year, right? So there's no language involved. I can just see my mother's frustration that I haven't gone on this little potty that I'm sitting on, right? And, uh, and there's a funny side story about that because I think my mother putting pressure on me there made it so that I could never be around anyone or public washroom or anything if I thought that the stool would, when it hit the water, would make a sound anyone could hear, right? Now, I went to prison a number of times for my crusades. And so I got over that prison will, will, will wipe you clean of all those kind of idiosyncrasies and phobias and stuff like that.